In this section we will deal with adjacent channel interference and jammers in general and their effect on the performance of OFDM systems and we'll use IEEE 802.11a as an example. Here we show the upper uni band for 802.11a. Each channel is separated by 20 megahertz. Here we show the desired channel at uh, 5.765 gigahertz. The adjacent channel is at 5.785 gigahertz and the alternative channel, which what we will refer to as the alternative channel, is at 5.805 gigahertz, and each channel is separated by 20 megahertz. If we look at the receive sensitivity table for 802.11a, here we show the data rates at 6 megabits per second all the way up to 54 megabits per second. The second column here shows the minimum sensitivity, that is the input power at the antenna in order to achieve a 10% packet error rate with a PSDU length of 1000 bytes and this is to meet the sensitivity requirements for 802.11a most vendors of course beat these requirements and have much better sensitivity than is shown here. Of interest to us is the specifications on the adjacent channel rejection and what this shows is that at 6 megabits per second, the adjacent channel could be up to 16 dB higher in power than the desired channel. And we still have to meet our minimum sensitivity requirements, even with the presence of a adjacent channel. And again, over here, vendors can actually uh, beat this performance here. For our alternative channel, the alternative channel could be up to 32 dB higher. And the alternative channel, adjacent channel, could be up to 32 dB higher than the desired channel, and we still have to meet the minimum sensitivity requirements. If we go back here, we see that the alternative channel could be much larger, up to 32 dB higher than the desired channel, compared to 16 dB for the adjacent channel. And the reason for that is that the analog filter, as we will discuss in the baseband radio, can actually filter out the alternative channel more than the adjacent channel and we'll discuss the reasons behind that. If we go look at 54 megabits per second we see we see that we need a larger signal compared to six compared to the signal at six megabits per second obviously and the sensitivity is much less and also since for 54 megabits per second the constellation points are much closer to each other we can tolerate less adjacent channel interference and you can see that over here with the specification that the adjacent channel rejection is minus 1 dB. In this figure we actually show the desired channel and the adjacent channel. They're separated by 20 megahertz. This is a spectrum and in the next diagram we show the spectrum in dBs and we see that the desired channel shown over here and we observe that the adjacent channel is around 16 dB higher than the desired channel and we should be able to reject the adjacent channel even though it's much larger and still achieve our minimum sensitivity requirements. So let's go over how we would actually tackle adjacent channel interference, a jammer, and still be able to meet the minimum sensitivity requirements. In this uh, graph here, we show the spectrum where the x-axis is frequency. We show the desired channel and the adjacent channel at a higher power level, both separated by 20 megahertz. And we're only showing the in-phase component for now. We see that in the case of a direct conversion receiver after mixing with the carrier, the signal is passed through a analog baseband filter, a low pass filter, we get the in-phase component and we sample it and convert it to digital. Over here I'm showing that we're sampling at a rate which is two times FS, FS in this case being 20 megahertz for 802.11a. Recall that in 802.11a the sampling rate was 20 megahertz and the bandwidth was actually 20 megahertz too. In this case we're talking about the total bandwidth including the guard intervals. Now in a particular architecture you can probably use a higher sampling rate but in this case we're using twice the sampling rate, just an example. So consider the 
analog baseband filter and its frequency response shown in the graph over here. The analog baseband filter uh, will actually hopefully filter out and reject the alternative channel. So let's go back to the diagram over here. We see that the alternative channel is separated from the desired channel and the analog baseband filter and the actual filtering stages and the direct conversion receiver should be able to filter out the alternative channel considerably and meet the requirements for 32 dB rejection at for example 6 megabits per second. So we are concerned mainly with the adjacent channel because the analog baseband filter cannot completely reject the adjacent channel and the reasons are as follows. If the analog baseband filter were to reject, completely reject the adjacent channel, that would require a sharp cutoff by the analog filter and that implies that the analog filter would have to be constructed from multiple stages with precision components that have to meet the requirements for a sharp cutoff and high rejection for the analog baseband filter. Now that's very difficult to do in terms of analog baseband filters, especially in a direct conversion receiver, especially when we consider the fact that we have both an in-phase channel and a quadrature phase channel. And the tighter the constraints on the analog baseband filter, then we have more problems in terms of IQ imbalance, for example. Of great concern is the fact that when you use complicated analog filters in order to meet the specifications to reject the adjacent channel with an analog baseband filter. That implies a larger area in terms of the implementation of the baseband analog filters on a RFIC, integrated circuit. And of course, it also implies a higher power consumption by the components. We've also indicated the fact that it's very difficult to achieve precision in these components and to match the INQ channel. So there's a great incentive not to implement a precision and high rejection analog baseband filter on the analog side and move that over to the baseband digital single processing side. So uh, we're more than happy to trade off complexity in the analog domain for complexity in the digital domain. Obviously, we can take advantage of the large-scale integration in the digital domain. Another reason for going digital is the fact that when we implement a filter in the digital domain, we don't have all the problems in terms of precision and matching uh, as we do in the analog domain. And the issue of uh, using a large area and power consumption uh, are much less uh, when we implement a digital filter in the digital domain. We'll get into that shortly. So there's a good reason uh, to implement a baseband analog filter that, that provides enough rejection of the adjacent channel so that when we do sample the signal, the in-phase signal in this case, with the in the analog to digital conversion process, uh, we avoid aliasing. So let's get into that. Let's go investigate what the constraints are on the analog baseband filter in order to prevent aliasing once we sample the signal and convert it to digital. Going back to these diagrams we see that if we pass the signal at the output of the mixer through the analog baseband filter obviously we're assuming that the filter filters out the double harmonic components and the higher harmonic components. We're only interested in the baseband components then in this case we get the spectrum shown over here. So this is the spectrum of the signal prior to analog to digital conversion and we observe that we're able to filter out partially the adjacent channel. However, there is still a large component of the adjacent channel still present in the signal. If you go to the next diagram here, once we sample the analog signal and here we're assuming perfect sampling with uh, perfect impulses we see that the spectrums are repeated at the sampling rate now notice that we're sampling at 2 times 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz 
we don't want to confuse F sub S, which is 20 megahertz, with the actual sampling rate, which was twice that or 40 megahertz. So this signal is centered at 40 megahertz and minus 40 megahertz. We see that they're repeated. Again, we're assuming perfect sampling with uh, impulses. In an actual system, when you sample a signal, you'll use a sample and hold, and you'll have a sonics over X roll-off. We're not showing that. Now let's go take a look at this picture right over here, this block diagram here. We have the signal at the input to the analog to digital converter. We sample it at twice the sampling rate, 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz. We're sampling at 40 megahertz. We convert the signal from analog to digital, and this is the spectrum at this point right over here after sampling. Now here we show a decimation filter and basically it's a two-step process. First we do a digital filtering at the sampling rate of the ADC, in this case 40 megahertz, and once we've band limited the signal we can safely reduce the sampling rate without too much aliasing. So after we do the filtering we reduce the sampling rate by half and we get the signal at 20 megahertz. Now the actual implementation of a decimation filter is left up to the implementers and there are many ways to do that which are very efficient. Here we show the frequency response of the digital filter, the baseband digital filter prior to decimation to 20 megahertz. So the filter has to reject all frequency components beyond 10 megahertz so we show that the filter is from minus 10 megahertz to 10 megahertz and we're only showing for example the in-phase component. So if we pass the signal over here through the digital filter, then we get the signal over here. This is prior to decimation by a factor of 2. So we're still running at 40 megahertz, and we're showing this point over here. And once we decimate by a factor of 2, we reduce the sampling rate to F sub S, then the spectrum looks like this, where they've moved closer to each other, and we observe that we have aliasing, uh, due to the adjacent uh, channel. So let's go take a closer look at that. So again, here we have the spectrum of the signal prior to the decimation filter. So we pass it through the decimation filter. Again, the decimation filter is not perfect. It's not a 100% block filter because we do have constraints uh, on the implementation of the digital domain and there are issues uh, that we'll get into a little bit later. So it's not like even in the digital domain you can have a decimation filter that is a, is a total brick wall. At any rate, the digital filter is still good enough in order to filter out the remainder of the adjacent channel such that we're only left with a little bit of residual adjacent channel after the decimation filtering. So after the decimation filter, we still have some of the adjacent channel. We haven't rejected it completely, and we don't have to reject it completely because we, we have to meet the requirements and actually exceed the requirements, but we don't have to reject it completely. There's a certain amount that we can tolerate, which is a part of, of course, the whole system engineering. Here we just want to show uh, what is going on in terms of the aliasing because that'll determine how much rejection you have to have in the design of your digital decimation filter. So once we filter this, this is running at 40 megahertz. We decimate down to 20 megahertz and the spectrums go into each other and we actually have aliasing of the residual adjacent channel into the in-band channel over here. So if we focus on this component right here, we see that this is our desired channel and the blue is the aliased adjacent channel into the in-band and there's no way to get rid of that after of course uh, we've done the decimation back to 20 megahertz. So this will be the effect of adjacent channel after uh, filtering and decimation. The lesson here is that there is a trade-off between the complexity of the analog filter and the baseband digital decimation filter. Let's go back here. If we take a look at the analog baseband filter, it basically has to reject the adjacent channel such that when we 
sample at twice the sampling rate or at 40 megahertz we don't have too much aliasing over here we have enough rejection of the adjacent channel so that we don't have too much aliasing when we sample at 40 megahertz if we didn't have enough rejection there then we would have aliasing when we sample at 40 megahertz from the continuous analog domain and there's no way we can get rid of that aliasing signal that imposes a requirement on the the amount of rejection we have to achieve in the analog baseband filter going back here we see that once we're at this stage here we sample at 40 megahertz and convert it to digital and at this point we pass it through the baseband digital filter followed by decimation and we get the signal here now in this case the baseband digital filter has to have enough rejection so that the ADS terms from the adjacent channel are such that we still meet our minimum requirements for sensitivity now there's a number of other issues that I'd like to get into and let's discuss it by viewing this diagram right over here another problem with having the analog baseband filter uh, having a very sharp cutoff and high rejection is the fact that that implies a longer impulse response for the analog baseband filter and the longer the impulse response of the analog baseband filter that causes problems in terms of intersymbol interference and it reduces your tolerance to ISI due to multipath fading channels there's another issue involved in the specification of the analog baseband filter in terms of the impulse response so it may turn out that you have to relax the constraints on the analog baseband filter in order to shorten its impulse response in order to provide more immunity to multipath fading and intersymbol interference and then move that problem over to the digital baseband filtering side where we can actually use for example an FIR type filter which has constant group delay and doesn't have that problem especially since most filters that are implemented in the analog domain are infinite impulse response filters so that's another issue that you have to worry about but we have flexibility in the digital domain in order to implement these things in terms of FIR filters with uh, symmetric FIR filters which have uh, constant group delay there's another issue that we want to talk about let's go back to this diagram and that has to do with the requirements on the analog to digital converter and the issue of automatic gain control when we have a very strong uh, jammer at the input of the analog baseband filter although we're able to filter out the jammer we don't completely filter it out based on the discussion that I've already had in terms of the requirements on the analog baseband filter and the fact that we're trading off complexity in the analog filter to complexity in the digital domain so if you move the burden of uh, completely filtering out the adjacent channel to the digital domain uh, that means that the signal IFT may contain a large component due to the jammer or adjacent channel compared to the desired signal so in fact the desired signal could be swamped by the adjacent channel energy and the automatic gain control would actually set the gain based on the adjacent channel signal level because it hasn't been filtered out and the dynamic range of the analog to digital converter should take that into consideration uh, such that the signal the desired signal which is repressed by the fact that the uh, adjacent channel power could be much larger is not quantized with too much quantization noise so that is an issue in terms of the specification of the analog to digital converter and the digital baseband filter would filter out the adjacent channel and we will recover hopefully with uh, le less distortion our desired channel signal so that's another issue and when we talk about the requirements on the analog to digital converter and the design of uh, 802.11a OFEM systems will actually uh, provide a, a margin for the presence of a jammer or adjacent channel and deriving the requirements on the analog to digital converter.